from the best, from the best initiative, private and public. Thank you very much because at the end, all of us are helping to become the Catalan economy, a more circular economy, but at the end to uh, helping not only the Catalan economy, but the European and at worldwide level. So thank you very much. I'm hoping that uh, today's closing session will be uh, uh, very fruitful as well. And, I've, and, and as I am aware that it has been the last two days, and thank you very much for your contributions. And thank you very much to the, organ the organizers as well, because without your help, it, uh, it wouldn't be possible to organize all this uh, fifth edition of the Catalan Cir uh, Circular Economy Hotspot in 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Castellanos, for sharing the firm and clear commitment of the government of Catalonia towards circular economy and shifting to a regenerative economy, supporting the creation of new markets and business and the design of new products and services. Based on ecological restoration, community protection, equitable partnerships, justice, and full and fair participatory processes. I now invite on stage Mrs. Patricia Aima, Executive President and CO2 of B Envirotech Biotechnology. Patricia is a biotechnologist and environmental engineer. In 2018, she founded B Envirotech Biotechnology, a startup dedicated to the transformation of organic waste, biodegradable plastics using bacteria. She currently runs the company leading the technological development of bioplastics. Patricia, you have the floor. Um, hello everyone, thank you very much for inviting me today to the closing of this Circular Economy Catalonia Hotspot 2021. As a Catalan and entrepreneur in the circular economy field, I'm very happy that Catalonia, not only these days, is a benchmark in circular economy around the world. We have a great opportunity to be leaders, to stop being dependent as we, as we are in Catalonia and in, in Europe on raw materials or energy from the rest of the world. We have the opportunity to be leaders in the circular economy by making the most innovative and cutting edge management of waste and byproducts. In this closing, I come here to present my company, the Enviotech Biotechnology. We are a company that transforms organic waste into biodegradable bioplastics. It's not only what we do, it's how we do it, because we use very special bacteria that feed on organic waste and produce the bioplastic. Here you can see the white balls inside the bacteria in this picture, it's the bioplastic. So for them, it is an energy reserve that allows them to survive during famine periods. At Venvirotech, we are dedicated to selecting and optimizing the best bioplastic producing bacteria. All for a very specific mission, to improve the quality of life on the planet through the preservation of the environment. The problem of very slowly biodegradable plastics is a widely known problem that reaches all the parts of the earth. Different legislations have been born to put a solution to it, but there is still a long way to go to change this global paradigm towards petrol-based plastics. With our technology, we not only focus on reducing the problems involved in these plastics, we also focus the problem of organic wastes, such as the one in the photo that I show you, that is the waste from milk production. All this waste is saturating the fields where it is thrown away to serve as fertilizer. And they are also saturating other recovery techniques which, due to the capacity and volume, cannot accommodate more of these waste, such as anaerobic digestion or composting. They end up thrown in the field causing contamination of aquifers with nitrates and sulfates that are harmful to human health. Examples of these wastes that we could treat are sewage sludge, pig slurry, food waste, milk waste. Our solution is the V0 plastic, a biodegradable bioplastic between six and nine months of the, it is of, of the polydroxyl canoat family, a PHA. PHAs are considered to belong to the polypropylene and polyethylene family and are therefore considered to be polyesters. In addition, a very important feature is that they are biocompatible. 
So therefore, we are dealing with a bioplastic applicable to packaging, biomedicine, or 3D printing. At Envirotech, we manage to have this bioplastic thanks to the process I'll show you in the image. We work with industrial companies that are genera generators or producers of organic waste, and we install the V-Box, the first step. This is the plant that is used to receive the organic waste in the customer's home, prepare it as food for bacteria, and make the bacteria fatten to produce the maximum amount of plastics inside of them. Once we have the bacterium full of bioplastic, we deshydratate and transport this bacteria to the step two that is called V out. In this process that allows the extraction of the bioplastic from the inside bacteria with green solvents, we have already this process uh, patented internationally. In this image, you can see the V box we have in Calidad Pascual, located in Gurb, Catalonia. It is a 100% automated and remotely controlled plant that contains the phases of waste reception, adaption, and fermentation, also filtration, and PHA production with bacteria. The reasons for installing the V-Box in the customer's home are because we, ha we save the cost of transporting the organic waste, and we take the advantage of uh, the biodegradability of the waste 100% there where it's generated. The plants are modular and allow to grow as the customer gro grows in waste production. Later, when we have the bacterium full of bioplastic and deshydratated, we move to the V-out, which is in the Envirotech facilities. It is a chemical plant that contains green solvents that allow the bioplastic to be extracted from the bacterium and precipitated in a solid state. The reason for the centralization is tend to control the quality and extraction costs that determine the final price of the bioplastic in addition to obtaining chemical production licenses. Therefore, our competitive advantage is in the business model, as you can see in the following diagram. Traditional waste management transport waste to the treatment areas, which means paying, paying for transport plus management. Other competitors with similar production models of PHA with, with waste follow the same train above, transporting the waste to management area, but in this case, to produce the PHA. In our case, we set, that we set up the bioplastic production unit at the customer's house. So, as I said before, there is no cause of transporting the waste. We specialize bacteria in the customer's waste, and we can grow as the customer grows and produce more waste. This way, we can have better price of the bioplastic in the market and also generate savings with waste management. Another competitive advantage lies in how we make bioplastic, and that we do it with bacteria. We are biotechnology, we are excellent in research, and we will be a key player for the future of the environment. What you see in the picture are, are our bacteria. They differ from those of our competitors because they are a mixed culture, not poor cultures. As you can see, they are black and round, they are black and elongated, or pink and elongated. We are characterized by working with many of a species of bacteria that live in synergy together. By this way, the by this way, we can just compete to other bacteria competitors. Um, this image has something very special, and it is made with a specific dye related to the bioplastic. Bacteria that do not have plastic are colored in pink, and bacteria that have the plastic are colored in black. So this way, we have the best bacteria and PHA producers. We are currently 27 people at the Envirotech, yes. 27 people in three years. And now we are self-sufficient in all our departments to push the technology forward. We have received great support in recent years, but what we value most is the support of the, is the, support of the administrations, such as what, what the support that we had from Axio and also from the Agencia de Residuos de Catalunya, as well as the support of entities such as Innoventures of Pascual, Bonaria, and on the Repsol Foundation they have given us the first opportunities. These are the numbers of Envirotech, a company leading the bioplastic revolution. In three years, we have won three major organic waste management contracts. We have raised more than 50 million in private funding and more than 300 uh, euros in public funding. Last year, we had a turnover of half, half a million euros and we have patented our own technology. Sometimes I look back to these uh, three years, and I see it huge. A few days ago, a few days ago, Ms. Machado 
one of the people behind this event told me, tell me about your experience as an entrepreneur, tell your story. This is a story of passion towards bacteria. To start this business, I needed to be comfortable in a comfortable position and more so in environments such as circular economy, which will often have an industrial component associated with it, which means more money for starting. To pull this forward, I work with emotional intelligence and a lot of patience. You must be able to listen and be very self-critical. I'm, I'm always under pressure and with high emotional loads. So having that said, you can understand that if there is no passion, all of this is not something that can be taken lightly. Look, I always say this partly serious because of Envirotech. My career as a researcher has been very, very short, and I could say that it has been a joke. In 2018, I got two doctoral scholarships, which I turned down to focus on this project, which really made me happy. And now I'm here leading a team of good people, a thousand times better than me in everything. If everything fits, if there is a market, if you have a good idea, if you have a smarter team than you, if you want to learn, everything will happen. Now in Envirotech, we are leading a social, environmental and economical revolution to promote the circular economy at a global scale. And that's what's made, what made me happier than anything. Thank you very much for this great experience and I hope that together we get the economy in a short time to be circular or not be. Thanks to the organization for this great day and I wish you a lot of, a lot of patience for everything. So thank you very much, a pleasure. Wow, this was a breeze of fresh air. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your ideas and your experience with such a passion for bacteria. Um, I also agree that um, it's not only what the Envirotech does or, or how, but for what purpose. So thank you. As I said uh, before, we are going to talk about emerging technologies and circular strategies. Catalonia has become a clear benchmark in Europe in, with regards to the creation of new business, especially technology-based ones. This growth is a result of different factors, such as local infrastructures, private and public support programs and services for entrepreneurship, a proper ecosystem where brave entrepreneurs but also incubators, accelerators, and investors are able to successfully develop their projects or having access and international presence in conference and trade fairs like the Smart City Expo World Congress taking place here these days. Technology is one of the major levers for accelerating circularity. And therefore, we would like to reflect on the challenges, the risks, the opportunities in develop access and transfers related to emerging new te uh, technologies. At this time, I would like to invite on stage Mr. Miguel Rubira, Director of Sustainability and member of the Steering Committee of the Eurocat Center of Technology, Maria, uh, Marta Escamilla, Sustainable Manager at Leita Technological Center, Mr. Leandro Navarro from the Department of Computer Architecture at the UPC, the Polytechnical University of Catalonia, Merce Barlseitz, Director of the Center for Biotechnological and Agri-Food Developments at the University of Lleida. And also Mr. Ander Errasti, Director and Head of, Director of Communication and Head of the Rector's Cabinet at the University of Barcelona, who will be moderating this panel discussion. Thank you, all of you, for participating. So, Ander, over to you. Um, bé, bona tarda a tothom. Uh, moltíssimes gràcies per estar aquí avui amb tots i totes nosaltres. És un veritable plaer comptar amb aquest panel per parlar un tema tan rellevant. Uh, I was just saying that it's a great pleasure, a great honor, and I'm very grateful for the organization of this uh, Circular Economy Hotspot Barcelona 2021 and all the supporting institutions for giving me and giving us the opportunity 
to talk about some issues that as we have already seen on the presentation of Mr. Castellanos, but also on the great inspiring example that Patricia has just offered to us, to all of us, how relevant it is the circular economy both for the economy and for the society, including the environment, of course, as a key element of the society. And in this myriad of elements that circular economy requires in order to, to be effective and, and to, to have the impact that we all desire, technologies, uh, of course, have a fundamental uh, role. And nothing better than having uh, four experts on this matter to deal with such a relevant dimension of the circular economy. And therefore, it's my great honor to present uh, the four speakers that we have today with us, who are Miquel Rovira, director of the Sustainability Area and the Swing Committee, um, Marta Escarrilla, responsible of the Sustainability Area, and Merce Balsage from the University of Lleida, and Leandro Navarro from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. It is my great pleasure to have you with us today. And going straight to the topics, but before going straight, just a uh, brief comment on the structure of the panel. We will have a four blocks uh, conversation where I will address some questions to our uh, beloved speakers uh, this afternoon. And after that, I will open the floor for the questions from the audience. And I have also finally uh, put some homeworks to our uh, panelists today, and they will be uh, providing us some uh, overview on the main challenges and the main opportunities that under uh, view we may have to address in the upcoming years. So therefore, uh, without any further hesitation, uh, I will launch the, the first question to the panel. And the first question actually which will be on which are the technologies that we actually need to accelerate towards this circular economy uh, scenario. Could you be able to put some examples of these technologies for the transition that are being developed in your center, university, etc.? And if you agree, we can start this way, and then on each panel we change the order of the uh, speakers. So, uh, first question and first speaker, Miguel Rovira, you have the word. Hello, thank you very much, Jander. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here as a Catalan. Ah, okay. I'm happy. The same? Si? I'm very happy that my country is organizing this hot spot. And also, as a regard, thank you for inviting us being here. So uh, going through the circular economy, I would like to put the example of critical raw materials. Critical raw materials are some materials which are very important from the strategic, environmental, and economical point of view. And they have risk of scarcity. We have risk of supply. Therefore, at Eurecad, we are developing several technologies in order to increase the lifespan of critical raw materials. For example, cobalt. All we have cobalt in the batteries, and what we are doing, batteries, for example, for vehicles. So the first point is try to avoid, we need to try to substitute the use of cobalt, because all we know that this is produced in, in from sometimes from unethical uh, strategies, because of the country of origin. So we need to substitute cobalt, and for example, we are uh, looking for new cathodes in the, in the batteries, avoiding the use of this metal. Then we are developing models in order to increase the life of the batteries. We try to, to, to increase as much as possible the lifespan of batteries. Uh, for example, predicting the behavior and the health of batteries. And once the battery reach the final use, we try to give a second life to the batteries. For example, using the batteries instead in a vehicle, using the batteries, for example, for stationary use. Okay? And finally, once we already cannot get anything more energy from the batteries, what we do is we try to recover cobalt using, for example, separation technologies, physical chemical separation technologies. In this way, we cover a very important part of the life cycle of cobalt, and we try to, uh, in some way, to keep cobalt as much as possible in, in the batteries. And very, very important also, I think it's crucial to measure circularity. We need to get indicators in order to know how we are good or not good increasing the circularity of cobalt. We always need to take into account the life cycle assessment of all the process. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. That was uh, actually, I think, a very accurate, um, straight-to-the-point comment on 
two main elements that we need to take into account. And I'm sure that Marta will want to join and go further on this. So, Marta. I will add here the bioeconomy and biological and biotechno biotechnologies. Okay. Do I need to use that? Okay. Uh, so, because uh, not to help us in the transition of this need to, to have an optimal use of renewable biological um, sources, okay? So, uh, to give you two examples that we work on, on later are, for instance, novel sources for ingredients. Uh, the example of bioproducts of the, um, the agro-food sector, okay, or also uh, marine biomass and, and microalgae. So we take ingredients for other sources in order to become resources. And also another type of technology that, that, no, that we are also working on and nature-based solutions. So those are technologies that no, nature is wise, so we use these technologies, no, the, this um, nature simulation, right, to help us protect and also manage uh, new ecosystems, natural and also modified. Uh, an example would be like we, uh, no, plants are used to, to treat wastewater, for instance, instead of chemicals, right? So in, in LATAD, we work, uh, we use these nature-based solutions for water and air treatment, no? They could be used for more, but we are uh, focused on, on that. And at, at the city level, for instance, uh, these nature-based solutions can be used to treat the municipal waste, but also in decentralized uh, level, we could use this in rural areas to treat grey water, so in places that we don't have uh, water net, so uh, we could use uh, these technologies to, to treat the, the water. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. You were saying that nature is wise. I'm sure that our colleague from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia is also very wise. So please, Leandro, uh, go ahead. Thank you. And uh, Paul, I never talked with two microphones at the same time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, nature uh, created this world and we, we create technology. I mean, it's human made, whereas technology. Um, uh, can be a part of solution or a part of, of a problem. Uh, for me, when, when we talk about technology, given my, my uh, work um, uh, affiliation, uh, I always think in terms of uh, digital technology. And, um, and you know, digital technology is, is based on, on devices which, which are uh, very polluting, I mean, full of uh, chemicals, full of uh, hazardous uh, and scarce resources. And then uh, these devices are built and then they are used for short, shorter or longer time, and then they are recycled. So, you know, the circular economy for digital devices um, is part of the problem because we produce more and more devices for, for supporting the, uh, all our processes, starting from our mobile phones, and, um, and, and then therefore it's part of the problem. We promote the circular economy uh, on the uh, life cycle of uh, digital devices, so through reuse, refurbishment, repair, uh, remanufacturing, uh, and proper recycling. Um, and that requires two main properties. One is transparency, is knowing what's going on, and knowing uh, how to do things, and, and knowing data which allows us to assess the impact. And then, uh, in, in that respect, uh, in the group we are working on something they call it the digital product passport, and um, in, um, we are part of the uh, UN uh, ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, where we work on, on trying to define global standards for collecting this data um, in a way that supports um, um, knowing everything and what to do with uh, digital devices. So this is about transparency, knowing. And the other one uh, is about um, 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 sometimes traceability or accountability, which is how do we prove things we say in this digital data, and then, for instance, when we say that a device has been recycled or when a device has been refurbished or, or reused, we need proofs. And then for the proofs, we are exploring the blockchain or, digi well, the blockchain or uh, distributed ledger technology to, uh, to support that. And you know, I mean, I said that um, ICT is part of the problem, but it's also part of the solution. 
I mean, three typical terms are used in, in our sector is uh, digitization, it's about introducing some bits into every, single, every process in the circular economy or elsewhere. Uh, digitalization is when things start to change and digital transformation, when, when a process, an activity, human activity is completely changed by the efficiencies and the opportunities from digital technology. So we are focusing purely on the circular economy of digital devices, but the solutions are applicable to many other sectors. Thank you very much, uh, Leandro, for this very inspiring also comment and the appeal for transparency and accountability as two main principles. And finally, but last but not least, we will have the intervention of um, Merce Valcells. Merce, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. No, I don't know. Thank you very much. I think it's better now. Yes. Yeah, the technological panel is having some issues with technology. <laughs> well, we are wired, but not well wired. <laughs> okay. Uh, I come from the University of Lleida. You know Lleida is an agricultural area of, the, of this country, and we mainly work in the area of biomass and wastes from agricultural activities. Uh, I think that the challenges that we have is that uh, it's quite difficult to deal with biomass to obtain mm, different kinds of, of bioproducts. When, you, you, when we have one single source of biomass, for example, wood from pine, uh, to obtain bioproducts, we can prepare a process to treat the biomass and then obtain uh, for example, lignin, and then hemicellulose, cellulose, and from these other bioproducts. Uh, the problem that we have in, in our area, and I think in many Mediterranean countries, is that uh, we have um, forests and the biomass we have from agriculture is very diverse. So it's very, very important, and we, need, we really need to have a strong methodologies to made pretreatments pre to the biomass according to its composition before we can use this biomass for obtaining bioproducts. So mainly I think uh, one of the challenges is in this area. And in our group we are wor working with several different kinds of biomass from, I don't know, olive oil, fruit, uh, processing plants, or even uh, pig rearing uh, wastes, or uh, in also um, from forests, biomass. And each kind of biomass has a different treatment that is required before we can, uh, we, we can obtain uh, well, lignins, uh, cell cellulose, and from this, the, the pathways to the bioproducts is more or less established, uh, the same as, uh, as is, it's been doing in other, in other countries. Thank you very much, uh, Merce. Actually, I think that it's great that in this first round we have gone through what you are already doing, which provides us some clues on how the technological use on circular economy has very different scope and very different areas where we, it can be applied. But now we should move to, to another issue, and I will actually invite you to, of course, interpel each other on, on your interventions, but beside uh, any comments you want to uh, say to, to each other, we should move to, to a second issue which connects with what you are already doing, because you have already said what you are doing, but now the challenge is how we boost, how we go further. And therefore, uh, I was wondering, besides the technologies that you are already developing, which will be the most promising uh, technologies to boost the transition towards this circular economy. And if you agree, now I will give the floor to Marta for making the first intervention and then we'll come back. So Marta, the floor is yours. And of course, if you, have, you can put examples to illustrate your answer, that would be great. Yes, so I will start with the novel biosources that, uh, that I was saying before. One of the most promising uh, that I think that it's the insect ready. Okay, so we were saying that we need to find these alternatives in ingredients and, and proteins. So uh, we are already working on, on insect uh, rearing in order to extract no, different substances for food uh, no, to, 
to make uh, sausages and hamburgers out of uh, different insects, and also for feed, for animal feed. But uh, we are also working on, on textile and also chemical applications. So to part, no, some parts or some substances uh, that could be used also for, for other sectors other than, than food. Okay, and then regarding the nature-based solutions, one of the um, no, most promising and really emerging technologies are electro-wetlands, which means that uh, if the example that we said that we had some plants, right, that are um, treating uh, wastewater, so we introduced there some electrodes to, to raise the yield of the technology, which means that while we are treating this, this water, so at the end we will have the clean water, so we also recover energy, okay? We don't have an energy that we can light up the whole city. We have uh, a small amount of energy, but it's enough to, to run the sensors, uh, some small sensors that we can use to, um, to for, for the same facility, okay? So that these different sensors, so that we can also uh, put these uh, electro wetlands in places where we, so we don't need to have electricity there so they can uh, run itself. So at the same time, you know, we, need, we have this clean water, but also this energy recovery. Wow, amazing mm -hmm. uh, example, Leandro. Oh yeah, you can go. No, and there. I was thinking also <laughs> regarding to nature-based solutions and, and cities, uh, there's also this, uh, edible city uh, concept. So we've been talking a, a lot about green cities and no? Re regenerative, resilient cities. So this edible cities goes a step further, which means that uh, through these nature-based solutions, we produce food in the cities, okay? So with uh, urban gardens. So here we have all this technology, but we also here need to include the citizens so we also have to work on this, uh, the social involvement, not only the, the technological issues. Amazing. Okay. So apart from this nature-based solution, Leandro, well, which ones would you highlight? Well, uh, I can connect with your point. Uh, we also look at the urban mining. I mean, mining of uh, uh, scarce materials, which you can get from cities, from urban waste, which is like uh, collecting, uh, when you collect like computers, you of course you can have copper, gold, uh, whatever, cobalt, uh, was mentioned before. So, um, but in order to do that, you need to know. You need where, where this, these uh, raw materials are. Or even better, if you don't need to destroy the, uh, in our case, uh, uh, a digital device, uh, you can reduce the parts and, and you can also, um, you can also reduce the devices. We, we found that, for instance, working with the Catalan government or working with the city of Barcelona, that, uh, or working with private companies, that uh, sometimes they stop using a computer because it's uh, not suitable for the task of the company or the organization, but still it's perfectly usable. And then um, reusing is nice because you, the impact of uh, manufacturing is already made, and then why don't we try to use it more? And we found that it's not only um, environmentally good to extend the life of, of a device, but also is so socially good. We work with uh, social enterprises who create jobs, uh, typically inclusion jobs. I mean, for people that is outside the job market, that they can work on collecting these devices, preparing them for reuse, and selling them for the price of the time invested in, in refurbishment, which is creates jobs and creates computers at very low cost. Um, but that that is difficult to scale, frankly. Um, and um, it, it requires a change in attitude, um, and, and I'm not sure if the capitalistic model in general can scale up these things uh, to, to the larger, but, uh, but definitely digitalization of the processes, and we know about, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, digitalization of processes has a huge potential of accelerating and improving the efficiency of e every product, uh, every process. So I'm, I'm really happy to be in, in an environment where people know about the circular economy so that we don't need to define it, but, um, but look at the potential that of uh, digitizing, digitalization, digitalizing transformation of your processes thanks to digital technology and, and imagine that ev everyone in the circular uh, lifespan had every detail about what to do and every detail to account the impacts and to be able to report. And, um, and uh, well, the kind of uh, 
um, paradigm of this is this uh, global and especially European effort to define the product passport for everything from construction to computing to whatever. And I, well, I, I really encourage you to look at, it, at this and collectively define what information should be recorded uh, to really make our circular processes as efficient as possible. Because you know, I mean, you, you know, it's, it, the circular economy is not about going fast, but because the speed is not defined by us, it's defined by climate change. So we only have one opportunity to win. Uh, if not, it doesn't matter too much what technology we develop because we won't be here to enjoy it. <laughs> Okay, let's hope that the first scenario is the one that we can go through. But anyways, uh, you have mentioned the escalating of the circular economy issue. We will go through that on the next panel, but uh, on the next uh, issue. But first, uh, Merce, after the nature-based, the digitalized uh, approach, what about uh, your perspective? Yes, in, in the area of biomass, I think that it's important to have methodologies to standardize the the biomass we get because um, plants are not uh, producing exactly the same every year so it's very important to to be able to know what we get uh, in the starting point of the process uh, there's also the need to develop uh, new enzymes or new uh, processes uh, to treat this biomass also uh, to have uh, solvents, new solvents that are more environmentally friendly uh, to separate the components of this biomass and this is really tricky, I would say. And also, I know uh, it's not very popular to talk about chemistry, but I think we need sustainable chemical processes because in the long term, we can use enzymes, but we also need to use chemistry to, to transform what we have in, in biomass and also when we want to recycle other products that we have been talking here, we need to apply chemistry, good chemistry with good solvents and we need to, to improve our methodologies in this work. And, and with, I think we have a lot of work to do here for the next generations. Thank you very much, uh, Marce. So, Mikel, you have the last word on uh, the issue of boosting this circular economy. Yes, in the field of critical raw materials, we usually work in a very inorganic world. I mean, basically, we have metals. And I think we can learn a lot from nature. Some of colleagues, my colleagues said this. And I, we see a lot of possibilities if we try to put some kind of biotechnological point of view in the processing of critical raw materials. For example, for example, typically when you try to extract a critical raw material from a waste, you, you use hydrochloric acid or nitric acid, strong inorganic acids. So there are some works already that use bioleaching. They use microorganisms in order to extract these metals. Even it is possible to, to try to develop some biosorbents, uh, substituting uh, s typical organic, synthetic organic solvents. So I think there is a, a lot of interest in, in this issue and we will see impressive results in the future. Trying to apply biotechnology, for example, to the field of metals. In addition, uh, we can think about green solvents like uh, ionic liquids, for example. We can think about 3D printing when we try to develop models modules for uh, metal extraction that are self-made in order to, to have very special characteristics, for example, regarding fluid fluidodynamics when you try to extract these metals, and also blockchain or traceability, as Leandro said before, because I think, for example, in a, in a smartphone, you have like 50 metals, okay? Most of them critical raw materials, so it's very important to know where we have critical raw materials in order to try to, to get a, a smart um, society in order to try to recover these metals. And sometimes even we don't know how much critical raw materials we have in a, in a smartphone. Okay, so I think also digitalization is important in this. So probably we will have a combination, an hybridation of, we will have a multi-technological approach. I think that will help a lot on in the field of critical raw materials. And very important, we need critical raw materials, I, did, I don't know said before, but we use them, for example, in health, 
even for the development of healing technologies, we need a lot of the critical raw materials. So let's see if these technologies go ahead in the future. Thank you very much, Mikel. Well, before going further to the third issue, I have to mention that the first thing I say to my students, uh, I'm a political scientist, nobody is perfect. Um, the first thing I say to my students is that in order to analyze properly a political phenomenon, you need to realize that it is by nature complex, so it is multidimensional. What we are seeing here in this panel, and for me at least it's been very enlightening, is that circular economy is also multidimensional phenomena and everything seems pretty much intermingled. But anyways, after this uh, um, privilege I use of, as a moderator, uh, I give the floor to Leandro for the third issue, which is, uh, and actually connects with the issue of escalating, and is the, the issue of how um, do you consider that these technologies can help to successfully transfer the circular economy to local companies? And if you can provide some examples and what we have, you have learned from those examples. Because at the end of the day, if we want to escalate, we always think uh, upwards. But first of all, we need to make the network in the local field. So, Leandro. Yeah. Um Thank you, and also connecting to some of the words that were mentioned before. Uh, we, you, you use the word standard, but in a, in a different way. Um, in order to transfer things, sometimes you need, for complex problems, uh, to standardize um, methods, solutions. Uh, uh, and um, uh, You know, when we were talking uh, with some companies about the circular economy, they were saying, yeah, but for instance, we are a telecom provider, and we get hardware from so many manufacturers, that, I mean, everyone gives us a lot of information, some in paper, some in digital format, uh, but we have to deal with all these and put it together. So uh, standardization is important. And um, at the global, let's say, local level, uh, uh, you, you need to define uh, uh, global standards to really enable uh, uh, businesses and, and activities. Um, because it lowers the cost, it, it reduces the risks and uh, facilitates interoperability. Um, at the global level. Um, and then at the local level, of course, you, you have the opportunity to apply uh, those things uh, into local uh, environments. Um, I don't know if you, if you are familiar, but uh, there's a Nobel Prize, uh, Elinor Ostrom, who talks about the, the commons approach, which is more regenerative than the, uh, the markets. <laughs> and um, they, are they are focused on preserving some kind of critical resource for a community. And then, um, and then we, we worked on, on that, and one example of that is that um, uh, about five, six years ago, seven years ago, we started um, an initiative called e-reuse, electronic reuse, which is uh, about um, working with uh, donors, uh, potential users, repurchasers, uh, recyclers, to uh, organize this um, uh, digitalization, digital transformation of the circular economy of these devices. And we learned quite a lot by learning by doing, and then we could realize we, which were the challenges and, um, and invented technology. So, so this is one example of a, of a federation of uh, for-profit and non-profit organizations. It reused, and then from the research group, uh, a couple of PhD students that, uh, well, you know, is partly typical of our environment. They don't see any opportunity to continue doing the search, and they, they saw the opportunity to create a startup to create di digital services for, for the circular economy of ICT devices. And, and we're working with them. And, um, and, and this is one example. But as long as there are standards, we can find another initiative in Austria or in Kenya or in uh, Argentina or in Colombia uh, that are also interested to use the same technology and apply it locally in different ways. So the ways that are applied locally are different the, the local ecosystems uh, are different, and they need local solutions, but we can come up with uh, common technologies, I mean, digital technologies, that can support all those processes. And then uh, we are working with these uh, different groups, but especially with the one that is uh, from our core team. And, uh, and we've been uh, a very <laughs> nice um, like business, uh, technology, science, like uh, endeavor in the last six years uh, to, well, to come up with a solution that works. And for the moment, we have managed to uh, somehow track about more than 10,000 computers, and we, we have learned quite a lot. And hopefully, well, um, uh, we might provide a useful solution uh, uh, 
I mean, to the to the challenge of uh, of of uh, the risks of ICT in e to our planet through through circularity. Thank you very much, Leandro. Uh, I'm sure, Marcel, that you will also have uh, some comments to make on this need of standards and examples of local implementation of these technologies and so on. So please go ahead. Yes, I can explain some experiences very different from the ones that Leandro has just talked. Uh, in the area, for example, of waste valorization, agrofood waste valorization, we have been working with several companies and one of, the, of our projects, I can explain uh, some part of it, is, was related to valorize uh, one, one byproduct of a company that uh, was, wor was working and, and producing fruit juice. Using this fruit juice to obtain uh, two kind of well the, the, the wastes from this production to obtain two kind of products. On the one hand, one aromatic substance that can be used in well I, that is in fact used uh, in food and in other in other mm, products, for example in detergents or soaps, etc. And on the other hand, we collected uh, the microorganisms that uh, were growing in that ways. So that selecting that those microorganisms and using those microorganisms over the extracted aroma, we were seeking uh, the, the, the possibility to change the profile of this aroma in order to have new aroma profiles with other applications. Uh, we think we we succeed in the in in the in our task, but uh, the main challenge was the scale up, and I think scaling up is really a very very uh, bottleneck in in when, when working in in this kind of of well in, with biomass at least, because uh, when you try to scale up the processes. Uh, things change very, very differently. Uh, microorganisms don't work exactly the same. Uh, heating, well, processing in general is very different. So uh, I think there's a, there's a, well, a pitfall, uh, something that we need to, to improve uh, this, this part of scaling up the processes. We are working on it. Now we have a, a, a small pilot plan trying to, to study the, the processes up to a small scale up, but I think it's it really a challenge. And some, well, at one point where we have uh, had a, a lot of to learn, we have learned a lot, and we have already a lot to learn about these, these processes, I think. Thank you very much, Merce. So I think, Miquel, that uh, Leandro was putting some, the relevance of generating some global standards and some common standards. Now, Merce has introduced how particular challenges affect two different fields. What about your perspective? Yes, I think that uh, we have to say that circular economy sometimes is not easy to implement. It's a, it's a great challenge uh, because we need to put in the same table, I think, the civil society, the, cons the, con the, the role of the, the consumer, we need to put entrepreneurs, we need to put the public administration, scientists, technology. So I think it's, 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 it's very important to have collaborative projects considering all these issues, which is not easy. Uh, I would like to, to put an example of a difficulty of a barrier of circular economy when you, you deal with uh, critical raw materials, when you try to recycle. And this is that when you try to recover a metal from a waste, you need a minimum concentration of the metal in order to make the process, the recovery feasible, because it depends on the concentration and also on the cost of the metal. So, because you are fighting against entropy, okay? So you, maybe, maybe you will put more energy than the, the benefit you can get, and we are talking about economy. Okay, so this is a very important issue. So when you start a, a circular economy project regarding the, 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 reco the, the value recovery, very, very important for me to have uh, decision tools that allows you to have an idea of the feasibility of the, of the project. 
And just to give a successful case, uh, we have been working uh, with different kind of companies, uh, companies, mining companies, wastewater companies, as well as engineering companies, and we have developed a process in order to get struvite, which is a fertilizer that contains magnesium, nitrogen, and phosph phosphates. Ph phosphor actually is a critical raw material. And we have done this collaborative, uh, in a collaborative way, and we have put all the interests of different stakeholders in order to have this new fertilizer obtained from wastewater. This is a good example, and I'm sure that the, the market of the struvite will increase in, in the future. And as any circular economy project, in this case, regulation are also important, because if you want to apply a new fertilizer, you need to take into account the regulations. So uh, important issue, this one. Thank you very much, Mikel. I think it's uh, your intervention actually shows that circular economy, the fact that we kind of all agree or share that it's a necessary uh, goal, it's not, it doesn't mean that it's easy. So I think it's important to, to highlight that uh, because that uh, I should invite us to put even more effort to make it happen yeah. properly. Anyways, um, you have the last word on this third issue, Marta. Yes. Regarding these novel sources, uh, I will explain you uh, an example of how we've been working with local companies, in this case with the food um, industry, okay, which uh, focus on bakery products like cakes and cookies. So they wanted to an alternative uh, ingredient, so we use insects here, uh, but um, with a double focus. So. Uh, they extract no, the, the substance from the insects to, to get the ingredients, but here the insects are uh, feed with the byproducts of that industry. No? So the species of love flower or different uh, no, byproducts that, that the industry had. So no, we really here close the loop and have a, no, a, the, a circularity approach. Here the technology was tested, no, as we were saying, like this, um, no, this scale up in our facilities, we have a food laboratory where we test, so we do all these trials that they can no, do at the, at the industry, and this wasn't a problem. Here, the problem is more the legal uh, issues that you were saying, right? Every uh, country has different uh, food uh, restrictions or directives, so no, in, in some cases, it is, no, you can sell something that has insects, in, not in other uh, countries. And also here it's more the social issues, like cultural, no? because in, in some countries it is easy to eat no? here. Nobody would say no to a lobster, but we don't know about the, the insects. So this is also something that needs to be work. No? We need to work on that be beyond uh, the technological part. Thank okay? you. And oh. then regarding the nature-based solutions, uh, we also work with, uh, with local companies, for instance, uh, a hotel, uh, a Villa Rural here in Sant Hilari de Sacalm, mm -hmm. is using these, um, no, these technologies to treat the, the wastewater of the, of the hotel. Also schools, we have a school in, in Valencia. So in this case, apart from no, all the benefits of using the technology, uh, this could also be used for awareness, environmental you know, and, and circularity awareness with the students you know, or the hotel uh, mm, consumers. You know? and, and we also work with municipalities. In Valladolid, there's a, a nature-based solution in, in a park. So also this awareness with the citizens. You know? So beyond the technology, we can talk to citizens and, and, no, and the students in, in this case to, to learn more about circularity. And Thank you very much, Marta. And we will move to the third uh, panel. And actually, I think that it's a very good, uh, very good wrap up of all what you have been saying. That is that as we, we have learned from or listened from the preliminary interventions, Catalonia, it's a region where actually the circular economy is boosted and supported from the institutions, from the civil society actors, from the companies, universities, of course. And I was wondering whether 
uh, you agree with this uh, perspective? If so, whether you can put some examples in the field that you consider that are valuable, and also which are the barriers that you still think that we have uh, in the community, in the territory, in order to deal with this and promote this circular economy approach. And in this case, Merce, you have the first word, so please go ahead. Well, uh, I, I think it's, uh, well, we are asking, you are asking about the, the, the future we have in this, I, in the area of circular economy. I would like to explain you one initiative that we are um, we are working in Lleida. There's a, an initiative that I think it's important because uh, there, there are uh, the Diputació de Lleida, several uh, town halls, the Cambers of Commerce of Lleida and Tarrega, the university, uh, and several producers. And we are trying to implement or, or start the idea of of, well, the idea is to change the economy in Lleida to a more circular economy. And we have started with wastes from pigs, but we are also uh, looking forward to start working with biomass from, from woods or also from pruning of fruit trees and also from wastes from, from olive oil and also waste, uh, wastes from slaughterhouses and use all these different kinds of biomass and start a pilot projects to transform this biomass, these different kinds of biomass into bioproducts. So uh, at this moment we don't have a startup, but we are planning with this project to start different uh, pilot uh, ideas or pilot projects to develop in the next future. Okay, don't know if... You have Something actually, Merced, and I think that the best way of answering uh, such a broad question might be putting facts on the table, and you have put a fact as an example of how uh, the implication of different actors is actually in the territory helping to foster this circular economy approach. Uh, Mikel? Si, yes, at Eurecat we, we are very active in, in training companies and training people, and what I see is that there is a still a lot of, lot of work to do in the field of training. Sometimes I see, I think that we have a barrier in the fact that circular economy is still not well known, even in, in, in a lot of companies. So I think events like this, like this one are very important in order to, to, to increase awareness about the, the circular economy. I think it's a, a great barrier. All, all we know what is circular economy, but we have the risk to think that everybody knows about this. So this is an important point. And if you go to the technological point of view, I think that as... In, as in any new technology, in any new process, you have a risk. You have a financial risk. So you need to combine uh, some people giving you money, and this is not obvious. And, and I think that it's important to, to know that circular economy has, as, as any process, has the risk to, that, that we can fail. I mean, as I said before, it's not easy. So sometimes it's not easy to combine people investing in this. but is something that we need to do as we do, as we do in, other, in other process. Uh, before I put the example of the minimum concentration that you, you need in order to, to get a, project, a process feasible. So this kind of decision criteria, I think, can help a lot in giving some kind of security when you are starting a new project and you are trying to, to involve circular economy. I think the good point is that the consumer is asking for circular products. So it will help a lot because people is asking for this, but there is a, a process that need to be escalated, as I said before. So, so Marcel said, said it before, and it takes time. It takes times, but we have seen the example of Patricia. I think that he gave us, she gave us a very good example on how is it possible to to get benefit from the, the circular economy. Thank you very much, Mikel, and I take note of the. You said that we need to increase knowledge and to raise awareness. Those are the two surnames of any university. So I take note of the homeworks that you put to us. Um, therefore, Marta, the floor is yours for the last issue. And not only the startup, but also SMEs, which I think they're not, that they don't have the resources, you know, uh, not to, to get where maybe they would want to. So we help them to accelerate 
right? And this, this market uptake and, and improve their competitiveness. And with the, once the technological gap has been fulfilled, so that we've no, really reached the, the technological that we want, we think that it's really important to tackle all these non-technological barriers that we have. And we have examples of um, circular economy talks about co-creation. So let's no, co-create until the beginning. So we've got this project where, uh, for instance, uh, regarding the NDS, for, you know, the nature-based solutions, um, we put them in, in a building here in, in Sabadell and San Quirze del Vallès. Okay, so we've been working since the beginning, of course, uh, with all the technological providers, all the experts, also with the administration. Uh, in this case, the, the owner of the building is the, um, the Catalan Housing Agency. So, but we also working with the citizens, the households that live there, because of we, they are going to renovate the building and they are going to include not only um, wastewater uh, solution, but also energy you know, and more efficient uh, different technologies. So this co-creation, we need to work all together. No? Not only the technology has to work, because if we don't have the citizens' involvement in doing the, the organic separation of the waste, uh, even though if the composting is perfect, the technology that we have uh, chosen is so efficient, if we don't have the rest, no, we won't have this uh, successful story at the end. So, so we really think that, that co-creation is one of, the, no, of our uh, challenges. Thank you very much, Marta. So Leandro, the last word on this fourth issue. Okay, so I would say it's, as we said before, it's a complex uh, problem with complex solutions. Um, and, um, and the ecosystem that you work with, I mean, the circular economy is, is a multi-stakeholder uh, endeavor uh, by definition. Um, it's really challenging. Um, and um, globally, for instance, uh, we are working with the uh, United Nations, this, uh, uh, we, they call it Global Digital Sustainable Product Passport Initiative. There, we easily found uh, Apple, Huawei, uh, Cisco, Orange, interested in, in working on it, and we have periodic meetings to discuss it. They have a lot of data, and simply they want to know how to standardize it. So this is one, uh, one case. And, um, and we don't need to explain them anything. It's simply they are contributing their experience uh, to, to the process of standardizing things. But then when you go in the local uh, scope, uh, you find um, public and private organizations who um, might not be uh, used to have digital processes inside. And um, it's very important to work with them and to support them into incorporating these uh, digitalization practices um, to work effectively and to make, we said before, sometimes uh, you, you deal with uh, something reused and then the value is negative. You need to put more money than the one that you get from, from, from it. So, so it shouldn't happen. So we find the digitalization is a way to reduce costs and, uh, and provide more information to be more effective or efficient, whatever. Um, so our local ecosystem is particularly well suited. Uh, over these years, we found uh, public institutions willing to, to collaborate. Uh, like at the beginning, I remember we were amazed by, by, by some studies from the GenCat that uh, they had about 30,000 computers which, are, which were uh, disposed every year. And then, I mean, it's a huge source of uh, devices, but you also need, I mean, it's a supply ch a demand thing. So you need to also find demand and, and supply, which is balanced. So, um, Compared with other communities, or other uh, localities in the world, uh, ours is, is quite uh, rich in all the ingredients. And really, sometimes we found that some other groups in other regions were not really able to replicate the process because they didn't have so many stakeholders. We found that companies, uh, governments, social enterprises are really bold and, and, and um, willing. Uh, and also, I mean, the scarcity of resources that we suffer uh, in, in many situations compared to richer uh, regions. Also, it's really uh, an, an accelerator for, for these kind of actions because it's needed. And I think the biggest obstacle, frankly, it's uh, red tape, it's bureaucracy, is that um, we need to reinvent ourselves and, um, and transform the way we work and also be ready to make mistakes. 
uh, it's more typical in the, uh, in the English speaking world that the people say, well, we know everything because we made all the possible mistakes. So then we know how to do it right. So, I mean, be ready to make mistakes uh, because they are the best like, uh, way to get. And if you are an organization that, um, that uh, has computers, probably all of you, uh, think about uh, donating them to, to local initiatives which are going to help your community. But of course, it's not enough to, to dispose these devices and give them to someone who might incur in a cost in recycling, by the way. But also think about buying reused computers, uh, although you will find that accounting procedures in organizations, even internationally, are against uh, doing this. Or you would find that your computer is amortized in three years, and then your organization has no incentive in keeping it, using it. So try to be imaginative and find ways to keep the circularity of, at least in my case, digital devices, as long as possible inside or outside your organization, because, I mean, it's, it's a critical challenge for our, for our world. I mean, we are, <laughs> a vaccine will not solve the climate change problem, so, so we, we need to act now. Thank you very much, Leandro. And now to close the panel, we will have a couple of questions from the, from the audience. I'm sure that there are plenty of questions on insects, on critical uh, technologies of digitalization, whatever. Uh, but we will skip it to two questions, so please um, go Thank ahead. Hi, thank you for your work. Um, I have a question because when we talk about circular economy, um, we're not taking into account, or at least I'm not hearing, one factor which is key to a bit. That is the economy, meaning not only sustainability in the, um, in the uh, producing form, but also the people. Is it is it uh, circular also for the people? Or are we losing money towards uh, an external way and this society is, uh, is not being circular and, uh, and it's going to poverty continuously? I don't know if, uh, if I'm explaining myself well, but um, that circular economy also has to be uh, sustainable for people. And I don't know if people is uh, right now uh, an issue that it's, is being taken into account. Uh, the, the question, I think it's addressed to the four of you, so autogestio. I, I can start if you want, because I already mentioned no, that the social, no, of course, like we haven't entered in the definition of circular economy, no, because we understand that we all know exactly what it is. But of course, we need these technologies. We need them to be environmentally uh, friendly. We need them to be, of course, economic. Uh, no, there has to be a, a feasibility, and also the no the person should be in the in the center of it. So, so we really need this social involvement in order for the technologies to work, and these technologies need like to improve the, no? the citizen's life. So, so for us, it, it is important that, that persons are, no? yes? Leandro? Uh, it's a topic that I like it very much. And um, but you know, we talk about circular economy, but uh, this is like uh, ignoring um, what's going on. I mean, we could call it spiral um, economy because there's always waste. We don't, I mean, we are not that good as nature. Uh, Lynn Margulis, a uh, uh, biologist, used to say that um, bacteria are more interesting than human beings because bacteria knows how to create the world we live in and humans so far has only demonstrated how we can destroy it. Um, so spiral, let's say, first. And second, um, I, I, if you look at the UN, for instance, uh, there, was a, there were the Millennium Development Goals and then they, we, we moved into the Sustainable Development Goals. One of the changes from the first to the second, which is revolutionary, is that inequality is part of the uh, SDGs. Um, there was a summit from the UN uh, about um, 
uh, more than 10 years ago that defined the three pillars of sustainability, which is the social, economic, and environmental. So uh, without fighting uh, inequality and involving people, uh, no way. So, so yeah, I mean, definitely, um, we have to look at these three pillars and make sure that it's uh, sustainably, I mean, it's available, it's viable at, at the economic level, that's a requirement, uh, but it also has to be fair at the social level. And, and we can continue di discussing, but yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's why, for instance, our, in our work, we work with social enterprises because that's a way to really uh, bring uh, devices. We work in preparing devices for, for, to include people in, in the economy, but also produce devices which are sold for less than 100 euros or less than 50 euros or sometimes for free uh, for people that cannot afford uh, to buy um, a device. But it shouldn't be only for people that cannot afford. We should, I mean, we can afford to buy a, sometimes a very expensive laptop, but you know the environment that can't. So you can buy a, a, a very big car, but nature cannot manage that. So we have to make sure and, and, and get used to, to work with second-hand things. And that's typical for cars. For instance, people like to buy second-hand cars, but not second-hand computers, or maybe not second-hand food, whatever. I mean, we have to change our mind. Uh, when I was a child, I remember that I, I hated uh, lobster, for instance. For me, it was like an insect from the sea. So we have to change our attitude and, and rethink that food has to be sustainable. Uh, and it can be tasty, of, of, co of course, but we have to change our prejudices res with respect to the circular economy and be part of it, not just to take one side. Miquel Mercé. Miquel. Yes, but I, I need a, a, a microphone. Oh. Yeah, please. No, thank you for the, the question. This is a good point. Sometimes people from technology, we talk too much about science and technology and, and we forget these issues, but I think that people is central in circular economy. And just I will give a, a point. Uh, circular economy will contribute a lot to the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it's uh, critical. Uh, circular economy will help on climate resilience a lot. We came from Glasgow. Now we are in Barcelona. So just an example of how is important circular economy for, for, the, for the humanity. Thanks, uh, Mercé. Last word. Oh, the technology again. A challenge. Well, I think, of course, uh, the society is the m one of the main actors of this equation. Uh, we have, of course, the technology, the so resources, but if people are not, uh, well, don't know what it, what it, it is, uh, circular economy, well, probably when we hear about circular economy, we are mm, well really mm, engaged to the idea, but the problem is then, uh, and then what? Well, it's not easy to implement the circular economy, but if the society is not involved, uh, things are not going to, 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 happen. to happen. Uh, at this moment, uh, each, each byproduct made from mm, biomass or well, circular economy, under the circular economy, uh, prospects uh, is usually more expensive, quite a lot more expensive than a product from the, the traditional way. We need to, to the, the, the society needs to push the, 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 the shift to the circular economy, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Merce. And I will finish with two apologies, one to the audience because there is no time for another question. I'm really, really sorry. I'm sure that in the coffee break or whatever, there you will have chance to ask any particularities to our speakers. And to the speakers, because I told them that we will have a last uh, minute intervention, but we don't have time because I have promised the organizers <laughs> that we were going to end uh, straight on time. As a final comment, well, I hope that uh, for all of you, the panel has been as thought-provoking and as um, enlightening as it has been, at least uh, for me. I'm really, really, really grateful to the four of you for this amazing dialogue, and I hope that we can see each other very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, amazing. Thank you. Thank you for engaging in this meaningful conversation. And where we have learned about critical raw materials, uh, new uh, novel sources, bioeconomy, biomass, biotechnology, nature-based solutions, digital transformation, well, a lot of things. If I may, 
and quoting uh, something that you have said, this circular economy community is ready to make mistakes, to learn from them, and also to succeed. Thank you. We'll now have a little break to stretch our legs and to have a coffee. And so, outside the room, and so we will be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.
aquí. Me voy a sellar 5. Ey, ey, ey. Ey, ey. Sí, sí. Sí, 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 sí. Hola, hola, hola. Sí, bueno, porque estoy aquí con el, con el micro. Ey, sí, sí. Pero ve, no hace nada de ruido. Ey, hola. Hola, sí. Sí, sí. Vale, este estaría tú. El 2 ya va bien. Vamos a dejarlo abierto. Ey, sí, sí, hola, 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 sí, nada de ruido. Bueno, tiene buena pinta. Hola, sí, 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 hola, 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 hola. Vale. Vale, el 3 también está. El 4, sí, el 4 también. No, el 4 y el 2 está. Ya te lo he sincronizado, que lo habían contado. Falta el 6. ¿El 6 ya lo ha buscado algo, no? Sí, 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 ya lo he buscado. Ah, mira que no coincide ningún número. El que yo no había sincronizado es el 4. Sí, sí, el que yo he sincronizado. Sí, sí, sí. 649, 150. 647, 445. 647, 445. Vale, y la misma de esta. Vale. Ahora, lo pongo aquí un momento. Estos dos dirías que vienen. Sí, ahora mismo sí. Pues vamos a hacerlo. Están encendidos ahora aquí. Hay una que no tendrá casi igual. O sea que ahora son 5. Esta es la petaca que está mal, ¿no? Que no entra bien, ¿no? Sí, que no se sujeta. Sí, no, 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 no juegues, que no va, no va a entrar. Vale, vale, estamos está. aquí de momento. Ey, sí. Espérate, el 6. El 6. Ah, vale, ahora igualmente lo probamos con ellos. Ey, sí, 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 sí. Sí, ahora lo vamos a probar con ellos. No. Ahora a este que... lo dejamos aquí.
No, no más, gracias a vosotras. Encantado de ser aquí. Ahora se ofende. Perdona, ¿eh? Sí, no te preocupes. Que ni yo puse. Vale, muy bien. Pues un par de man, par de moon, para que sí, ¿no? Después te la. Sí, no, vale. La petaca que esto. Pero si no el fiquem aquí, ¿no? Ahí va. Astra, atrás. Sí. Don, a ver. Astra. Estén bien en pasos de formiga o no evitem bien en pasos de gelat. Ya no sé. Ya no sé. Molt bé. Sí. Bueno, no, no, per saber si hi era, no, per mencionar la presentació. Sí, sí, i ara què faig? Aquí, no? Aquí? Aquí? Pots? Ah, és un... No, però era... Està bé? Sí, sí. Sí. Sí, per mencionar-la o no, m'entens? Sí.
Jo és que sempre que he fet un edat, sempre he fet dues de les dues. Escolta, la mascareta la torneu a posar o aneu sense mascareta? No menciona algú que no hi és, no? Si està l'Anna, perfecte, l'Anna Bernat. Perquè ara que m'has passat tot això... Que és secretari for climate action. No, 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 no
We're back. Thank you for staying with us. This afternoon, we also want to discuss about another key element. We need to talk about finance, both from a regulatory and investor point of view, and about how crucial is mobilizing private and public funding to accelerating the circular transition. At this time, I would like to invite on stage Mrs. Eva Hernandez, independent consultant and responsible for sustainable finance at the Institute for Financial Studies and also collaborator of the European Financing Planning Association. Mr. Olive Canosa, head of Sus sustainable finance at Tecnoambiente. Mr. Xavier Fabregas, managing director at the Caixa Engineers Gestio and Investment Management Firm. And Mr. Luis Herrero, president of the Barcelona European Financial Center for Sustainability, who will be moderating this panel. Over to you, Luis. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Barnabas, Secretary for Climate Action, Generalitat de Catalunya, authorities, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As president of Barcelona Centre Finance Europeo for Sustainability, let me first of all express my sincere gratitude to the CE Hotspot 2021 organizing team for giving us the possibility of participation, participating at part actively in this event focused on the circular economy. This is uh, Barcelona Centre Finance for Sustainability is member of the Financial Centre for Sustainability, FC4S, the international network of more than 35 cities all over the world focused on the develop and improve the use of sustainable finance to achieving the 2013 Paris Agreement goal and that is sponsored by the United Nations Development Programme. We feel honoured participating in this panel dedicated to knowing through the contribution of the expert panelists that join us today, how the sustainable finance can contribute to the needed transition to a circular economy that helps to achieve these objectives. The panel will give us the opportunity of knowing directly from the explanation of high-level specialists the actual situation of sustainable finance as well as their own experiences, opportunities, and challenge of how to finance a circular economy. Panelists will have a few minutes to each to make their speeches, and at the end of the three presentations, we'll open a tour of questions. With no more delay, let me introduce you the first of today's panelists, Ms. Eva Hernandez. Eva Hernandez is an independent consultant, expert in sustainable finance and change management, responsible for Sustainable Finance at the Institute of Financial Studies, EF, and collaborator at the European Association for Financial Advisory and Planning, EFPA, in Spain. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, what I would like to do is to introduce a bit what sustainable finance is for those of you who don't know about the, um, about the topic, to talk about the recent developments because really we had a revolution in the, in the arena of sustainable finance and also a bit about the challenges and what is the connection to the circular economy. Please, if you can put me my presentation. Thank you. Ah, ah, thank you very much. Okay, sorry. Well, so um, I, I brought to start a definition of sustainable finance. Probably some of you already know, but I thought that it was the best way to start this, given that we're talking about this topic. And basically, sustainable finance is not so different from traditional finance. Really, we look at the similar issues, at the risk and return, but also in sustainable finance, there are other uh, criteria that are important that are uh, defined by the three letters, ESG, environment, social, and governance. Here I put you the definition of the European Union. And basically, when taking these financial decisions, which at the end, they take into account the risk and return that are very important, also we take into consideration 
these environment, social, and governance factors. And really, what has made the sustainable finance to grow and become mainstream has been the first of these three letters, that is the environment. All the concerns about the climate change. There are two very big developments that I'm sure you know about, the, the Paris Agreement and the, and the um, SDGs, the Agenda 2030, and that coupled with, uh, with other issues that I would say is like the pressure of the public, of investors, like to change the ways, like the, the effects of the financial crisis of 2008 as well, which demonstrated that not always looking for the interest of the financial markets, it's the interest of everybody. I think that all these trends coupled with regulations, they have made this sector really to become mainstream. And well, uh, after the, the, the Paris Agreement, as you already may know also, the Europe has a very ambitious uh, climate goals. There is the Green Pact, and a very important part of this Green Pact is the, uh, the objective of being a climate neutral economy by 2050 and reducing emissions by 55% in 2030. And why I'm talking about that? Uh, when, uh, when we are talking about finance here, because this has been a very, very big catalyst for all this. Because when uh, Europe uh, defined this Green Pact that also includes promoting the circular economy, as you know, they realized that a lot of money was needed. A, a lot of financial funds, they were needed to finance all these activities that we are going to need in order to make this transition. And they realized that with the money of the governments wouldn't be enough. So the European Union came, came out with an action plan on sustainable finance. And this has been really this revolution in this sector because suddenly a lot of regulations are coming that are completely changing the financial system and are creating incentives for all the players to really look at those projects that are going to help. Between those projects are the projects that have to do with the circular economy. Then this action plan on sustainable finance was, was issued in 2018. And since then, uh, we've seen a lot of change. And I think what really has made uh, sustainable finance to be so important and to be on the, on, on the mainstream, on all the news, and on, on, the, on, on the minds of everybody. So these three objectives of the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. First is reorienting capital towards sustainable investment. And this has to do with the corporate social responsibility of the financial institutions as being very important actors in the directing of funds in the economy. Uh, the financial institutions, the financial markets, they decide where the funds go which projects are going to be financed. And, 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 and this plan, what it's trying to do is to make the financial institutions to take responsibility in this transition. So that's the first objective. Then the second objective is mainstreaming sustainability into management. So uh, making sustainability to be uh, in the mindsets of the companies, the corporates, the issuers, and the financiers. And thirdly, fostering transparency and a view on the long term. Because really, if we want to promote sustainability, we cannot be looking at the next quarter earnings. We need that to look more long term and to look at the profitability of the companies in the long term. And in many cases, the financial markets, every time they were promoting more short termism, to looking very closely in time and sometimes making the companies and the and the management teams to take decisions that they were not good for the long term. So with these three objectives in mind, and with this big objective of making the funds to go to the right investments, there are a lot of actions that I'm not going to mention Do you have here. Probably you've heard about some of them. There is the new taxonomy of the European Union to define which activities are green, which one of the environmental objectives in the taxonomy is promoting the circular economy as well. 
there is the new green bond standards, there is standards of transparency for the financial institutions about which investments they are making, there is uh, new reporting rules for non-financial issues that are going to be very important because one of the problems of uh, taking financial decisions, taking into account sustainability, it has been the lack of good information and the lack of coherence between the different sources of information. So many of these actions in the plan, they are trying to, to do that, to, to put a, a feeling which we can, com can compare things, we have the same rules, we have the same definitions. So this, this as I was saying, was issued in 2018, and since then it's been a revolution, and I think it's going to continue to be like this, because uh, I think uh, looking at sustainability in finance, it has arrived and it's going to stay, and in my opinion, in some years we're not going to talk about traditional finance and sustainable finance. Why? For a reason, because all this started with people that uh, they were considering the ethics and the protection of the planet. Like the first uh, corporate responsibility funds, the first uh, uh, sustainability investments, they were in the late 90s, in the 80s, late 90s, and they, they were based on ethics. It was a very uh, small sector. It was very based on, on, on taking financial decisions according to values. And always the question was, is this profitable? Are we, are we losing profitability because of doing this? Now, with all this regulation, but especially with the, with the climate considerations, even for those funds or for those institutions that uh, they don't care, which I don't think anybody can say that they don't care, but even for those investors that are more traditional and take less consideration of these factors, these factors are becoming every time more a question of financial risk. Financial risk because of the risks of the climate change, but also from the risk from investors and from, from the public in general that is asking every time more that the financial sector makes this transition in the context of a changing paradigm in business. So some thoughts to, f to fin well, and here you can see like the growth in these kinds of instruments. Like uh, the, green, the green bonds, the green social and sustainable bonds are fixed income products. And they're fixed income products that the only difference with a normal bond is the kind of projects that they are financing. In the case of green bonds, they have to finance uh, projects that are helping the environment in some way. So for example, green bonds, are a, it's, it's a, they, they are inside the impact investment because it's very important to create an impact with the investment. And in many cases are used to finance circular economy uh, kind of projects. And you can see here in this graph the growing issues in this kind of, of products. It's been amazing in the last few years. The green bonds has been one of the most successful financial sustainable products. Uh, in 2020 also, like in the context of the COVID, the social bonds that is the same but devoted to social projects is been the same, a big, a big increase, still a small in the context of the, of the financial sector, but, but, but very big levels of growth. Uh, for from the point of view of the retail investors, every time more money uh, flowing into sustainable funds, you can see the, here the data of the last two, three years, same, same kind of history. So, so it's really a big trend, this sustainable investment. And after talking a bit of what is happening with the regulation and, and what is happening in the markets, I want to leave you with some final thoughts. Uh, well, uh, the, the financial industry has expressed a commitment because it's very clear that the financial sector has a big role in this transition to a carbon neutral economy. We need a lot of investment. This, this is there and, this is, and there is the pressure by the regulation and by the, and by the public, as I was saying. 
Uh, we just uh, had the news from the COP26, and, and there, there was a big agreement. The UN climate envoy, Mark Carney, he assembled uh, an, al an alliance of banks and financial institutions for arriving to this net zero economy. And he put the figure at 100 trillion of dollars over the next three decades to achieve this. Uh, uh, a lot of banks and insurers and investors, they have pledged to put their commitment to do this transition and to, and to put those funds to, to combat the climate change. So the commitment is there. What we need now? I think the challenges ahead is, well, we have to change the paradigm, and this is something that has very much to do with the circular economy because the economic growth has to be decoupled from the use of resources. And in order to achieve that in the financial context, what we need to find and execute is those projects that really have an impact and create change. That's going to be very important. And for those projects, it's important to have an adequate risk return for the capital. Uh, a big topic is greenwashing and impact washing that we can discuss later. And I think uh, a lot of this plan of the European Union, it goes in that, in that direction to avoid the greenwashing, to have more transparency and to have more of rules. And another big challenge is to unify the criteria and to level the playing field on a global basis, because Europe alone is not going to do the transition. We need the whole world on that. So I leave you with this food for thought. And uh, here I put a sentence of uh, one of the co-managers of one of the funds that has been pioneering the circular economy, a fund that was uh, issued by BlackRock in 2019. And, and, and what they were saying when they launched that fund, they say we see a relocation of resources and capital towards more sustainable investing as a key tenet of a transition of a more circular world. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Evan. Now is the turn of Mr. Xavier Fabregas. Xavier Fabregas is a professional in both in finance and markets for more than 20 years, almost all his career in the asset management industry, particularly in collective investment schemes. He is managing director of Caja Ingenieros Gestión, a branch of Group Caja Engineers. Xavier. The floor is yours. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Luis, uh, and, and thanks also to all of you for being here. Um, just to share some thoughts about what uh, previously commented uh, Eva. Um, back to the uh, investor point of view, what is challenging for investors now is to change the way we look through the investments. This is a traditional uh, way that we look through an investment uh, portfolio. Uh, mutual fund or any collective investment uh, scheme. And the typical breakdown is uh, among sectors, among market cap, among uh, regions, but no mention about climate change, no mention about uh, any metric related to environmental uh, topics or issues. So obviously we need to speed up. Um, and, and in this way, um, some asset managers, and cash engineers is one of them, we are um, taking attention to other metrics like the, the like, uh, carbon intensity. Carbon intensity right now is one of the main metrics that we are following in our portfolios in order to assure that uh, the, the path to uh, uh, a scenario where the warming of the temperature will not exceed 1.5 is something that we can uh, assure that we can um, get. In, in, this, uh, in this draft, we, we, can, we can see um, that the, our portfolio, our investments are aligned with uh, a scenario that uh, the Paris Agreement uh, drew back to 2015 um, of 1.5. So this is one of the main um, uh, challenges that we have to um, some somehow uh, to to move on. Um, if our portfolio, if our investments are aligned or not with uh, 
uh, sustainable development scenario. This sustainable development scenario is 1.5. It could be higher depending on the investment you do, depending on the background of the sectors where you invest, and obviously it's something that you have to pay attention. Another uh, table that uh, I would like to talk about is about that typically as investors we focus on those companies that uh, represent uh, the, the majority of the portfolio in terms of uh, weight. And now the way to look through this table is uh, in terms of uh, carbon emissions. What companies um, uh, are more polluters in terms of uh, carbon emissions? And then you, as an investor, have more infor uh, information regarding what should be done in the future in terms of uh, reducing those uh, emissions. Okay, so it's another way to pay attention into the environmental uh, issues. Um, something that uh, Eva commented uh, before is about uh, physical risks. Physical risks are something that are impacting as well uh, to, uh, to investors because at the end they are putting their money uh, on risk if nothing is done in terms of climate change. Uh, typically uh, we look to mm, metrics like value at risk, but it's a metric that tells you how much exposed are you in terms of uh, risk uh, into, a, into a, a specific investment. Um, but when we talk about uh, physical risk, we talk about uh, risk like, in this slide you can, you can see it, uh, tropical cyclones, coastal floods, river floods, wildfires, head stress, droughts. Well, in this specific uh, um, portfolio, you have uh, up to 2.7 million at risk because of these hazards. So uh, this is also something that investors should uh, take uh, into account. How much of my investment is on risk uh, regarding this uh, physical risk? And, 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 and that's another thing that the I think it's important that um, only 4% uh, of the portfolio in this case, and only 2 or 3% of the portfolio, uh, of the benchmark, sorry, has robust plans to mitigate these risks. So obviously there's a lot of uh, room to do, uh, a lot of uh, things to do in this particular uh, metric, in this particular topic. And finally, um, what is important for any asset manager right now? is to look through the range of uh, funds, not only from uh, financial valuations, but also from uh, climate risk uh, metrics. Sorry. Um, for instance, for any given portfolio, we are uh, checking uh, what is the budget that you are aligned with a 1.5 uh, degrees uh, a scenario. In most of the portfolios, in most of the funds, we are aligned until 2050. But in some cases, because of the breakdown of the portfolio, because of the breakdown of the companies we have in the portfolio, uh, it's uh, a bit earlier. Th that's that's uh, something that we want to uh, work on and we obviously want to delay those, uh, uh, those dates. Okay? Um, Another metric that is important is uh, carbon risk uh, because at the end one of the main metrics we have uh, for analysts is to quantify uh, how many uh, tons of uh, carbon are emitted mm, because of the companies you own in your portfolio. And, and here, uh, the you, can, you can see in the second column, you need the, the, the number as low as, as possible because the lowest, the better. And for instance, our environmental uh, fund is the one that has a lower um, carbon footprint in terms of carbon intensity. Carbon intensity is always uh, tons of carbon emitted per uh, one million of uh, revenue. Okay, so this is uh, the way to connect uh, climate change, environmental change with uh, investments from the point of view of uh, an asset management. Thank you, Chave. Finally, let me...
Finally, let me introduce you the last of today's panelists, Mr. Oliver Canosa. Oliver Canosa is the head of sustainable finance at the international consulting firm Tecnoambiente. Before joining Tecnoambiente, he worked as a consultant for the United Nations, international NGOs, and other multilateral organizations. Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis. Um, thank you also, Xavier and Eva, for, for your explanations. Uh, I think it's been very useful for the audience to, to understand a little bit better what's, what's sustainable finance. Um, I don't have a presentation, but um, my, uh, my, my speak will be about um, a little bit to, to clarify a little bit what some of the comments made by, by Xavier and Eva and provide a little bit of uh, expansion on, on some of the definitions and, and details provided. So, um, whenever we're saying um, sustainable finance is about ESG, it's about environment, it's about social aspects, it's about governance. Um, yeah, uh, Chavik gave a, a very, very detailed explanation about one of the topics analyzed in the E of ESG. Uh, it's climate change, okay? Uh, he focused very much on the physical risk of climate change, but when we are looking at ESG metrics, uh, we are not only looking at climate change from a physical point of view, but also from a transitional point of view. So how companies are preparing their transformation of processes, their management, their risk, uh, a strategy to deal with uh, transition to a low carbon economy. Apart from climate change, we are looking at waste generation. How much waste is each company generating? We're also looking at water consumption, relationship with natural capital. So we are looking at a broad uh, spectrum of, of, of topics uh, to give kind of a, a grade uh, on the environmental aspect. Um, on the social part, there's also plenty of metrics that we are analyzing from uh, equality, from wage gaps, from uh, yeah, other, other types of, of, of issues. On the government side, we are looking at how the company is managing the environmental and social aspects, how it's the decision-making roles uh, distributed across the board, across the non-executive board, how is the compensation doing in terms of emissions, for example, in terms of waste generation, etc. And then moving to the, to the EU Green Deal, uh, I think Eva made uh, very good points there. Uh, but um, I just wanted to provide a feeling of how sustainable finance is linked to the EU Green Bond. Um, basically, the EU Commission sees uh, sustainable finance as a tool now. It's not a topic to work on and to make more sustainable. No, sustainable finance right now will be a tool to mobilize investments to change the the production of products, the services, the whole economy, to use these funds, the allocation of funds, to transform the whole of the EU economy. Um, and, be, and, and to do that, they have approved this EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan, um, which has many regulations. I would say the three most important ones are uh, the EU taxonomy that Eva was mentioning, also for financial institutions, the EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation to avoid greenwashing in the marketing of, of investment funds, and also on, on climate change for uh, investment funds, there's the, EU, there's, the EU, there's the EU Climate Benchmark Regulation, which is a different type of regulation looking at how climate change can be entailed into uh, investment perspectives. Um, if we focus a little bit on, on the EU taxonomy, which is the main piece of regulation of this new uh, EU Green Deal, um, the, the, the EU taxonomy is basically a dictionary, okay? So um, the EU taxonomy uh, provides a list of economic activities and under what circumstances they are considered sustainable or not. Um, to consider a an activity a sustainable one, it needs to uh, comply with certain uh, points. First one being uh, contributing to one of the six environmental objectives of the EU. Uh, to mention some of them, there are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, uh, promotion of the circular economy, uh, pollution control and prevention, uh, biodiversity, etc. Then uh, companies need to comply with uh, certain technical standards. So there's thresholds, there's metrics, there's certifications, etc. And uh, finally, uh, these uh, activities to, to, to be defined as sustainable, they need to uh, comply with uh, do no significant harm criteria. So they cannot 
damage uh, other objectives or activities, and they must comply with certain safeguards in terms of uh, oh, in terms of uh, social sustainability, environment, etc. Um, uh, if we move to the sustainable, uh, the the broad range of sustainable products that are uh, available right now to to the market. Eva was mentioning green bonds or sustainable bonds, climate bonds, etc. Um, these are a very specific type of bonds, but um, why are we seeing this boom in, in sustainable finance, sustainable investments, in, in sustainable finance products, basically? Um, both the financial uh, participants and, and companies are seeing a market demand for uh, sustainable products and services. Um, there's also a lot of regulatory pressure from the EU and, and from other countries. Um, there's raising risk on climate change. We've seen that in California. We've seen that in Australia with wildfires. Um, but there's also opportunities for the financial sector to uh, invest in the new champions of this climate transition. So, I mean, the idea is that the next Google, the next Amazon, the next Facebook will not be uh, fossil fuel industry will be s uh, a company that's prepared for dealing with this transition. It's a company that is that that has a key role in in addressing climate change. So that's 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 the thoughts, and, and that's why sustainable investment is growing so much in in these last uh, years. And and finally, uh, based on on the presentation of of Xavier, uh, financial institutions need tools. They need data but they also need tools to, trans to take uh, net zero commitments, for example, to the investment uh, desktop to, to, to understand how uh, the company will implement this net zero commitment, to understand how the company deals with natural capital, for example, how it's linked with biodiversity, what are the risks of being linked uh, with, with certain aspects of biodiversity. And then um, apart from that, they need data, they need transparency, uh, and they need, uh, I would say, um, broad tools that uh, take into consideration data not only from a specific company, but from the market, and also all the, all the data that the, that the government and the public administration has, and it needs to be available to investors to understand better climate risk and, and environmental risks. And that's the bit of my, my point of view here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I, I think that we have five minutes, five minutes for, for three, three questions, and from Eva, for Eva. What is the link, and one minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the link between financing the circular economy with a sustainable economy? Well, I, I think uh, in, in, in I think what, what the financial institutions, the asset managers, the impact investors, what they need right now is projects. Projects that are worthy to invest because as uh, Ol uh, Oliver was saying, um, there is demand and they're going to be like the companies of the future. Those that are able to bring products and services that allow us to make this transition to a, a different paradigm in the economy. So I think the circular economy is going to be very important in that transition because in this decoupling, of the economic growth and the use of resources, I think it's very clear that the projects of, uh, that have to do with the circular economy are going to be, there are going to be opportunities of investment there. And we are seeing that already with the growth of green bonds that are going to this kind of, of, uh, of investment. Thank you. Xavier, um, one minute. <laughs> How do you implement uh, your goal of maximizing profitability along with improving ESG impact. What are the difficulties and challenges? Well, the main challenge is uh, to transparency issues and data. We need data as investors to take uh, decisions uh, formally, and, and obviously this is the main challenge. And how we do it um, to to protect our uh, investors 
and taking into account ECG factors basically is uh, through um, a deep look through of the of the company activities from the environmental and also social point of view. <laughs> and we rank the companies, we score the companies uh, in different uh, aspects. We take into account, let's say, 150 uh, um, data uh, inputs, and then we score those uh, those data into our uh, and we rank it. So basically, we we try to to select those uh, companies more committed with the with climate change uh, issues and also with. Uh, with the social uh, pillar as well, because it is one of the most important also uh, for, for us. And then finally, um, there is something that is very clear. Climate risk and environmental risk, as well as other uh, risk, uh, impact on the uh, cost of capital of the companies. Mm -hmm. The better they are in terms of ECG, the, the, the better they have uh, funding and in, in, in better conditions. So at the end, it's also uh, from the financial point of view, it's a win-win uh, bet. Thank you, Xavier. And Oliver, last not the least, how can green and sustainable financing mechanisms enhance circular economy? Uh, thank you, uh, Luis. I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, question. Um, as, as Eva was mentioning, there's now um, certain financial products that can uh, enhance, uh, reinforce, and, and, and motivate companies to, to increase the circularity of their business models. Um, one of them could be green bonds or sustainable linked loans or, or bonds. Um, they looked at, at, at different types of, of criteria on the, on the E uh, part of, of ESG. Um, by using the ty this type of, of financial products, uh, companies are uh, required to improve certain KPIs or uh, get certain certifications or improve in terms of a strategy to uh, have lower cost of capital, as, as, uh, as Xavier was mentioning. So I think uh, the use of uh, innovative financial products as sustainability-linked loans, sustainability-linked bonds, or, or climate bonds, or any type of bond that it's or loan that it's using this uh, first part that relates to environment um, could be positive uh, if we focused not only on emissions but we focus only on on circular economy and that that's very very important when we talk about uh, waste management companies for example um, here they need to prepare very well for for the transition to a decarbonized market and a, and a circular economy so uh, these KPIs related to uh, the circular economy will be very, very, very uh, important. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And okay, to close, I don't know, I have the time. <laughs> and to close the event, let me just uh, thank again uh, the C Hotspot organizing team for giving us the possibility of participating actively in this event. And to all of you, for for your participation and contribution on, in, on it as had allowed to conduct of the leading circular economy event in Europe. I think we can close here the financing roundtable uh, called Talking About Financing Activities. And once, more and once more time, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So whether we're talking about bonds, loans, or other financial products, um, and I'll be quoting the quote, uh, the money is here, but that money needs to be uh, to net zero line projects, and I would add circular align projects. And then there, was, there is a way to turn this into a very, very powerful virtuous circle. So thank you again to the panelists for this um, sharing your views on this um, panel discussion on, on finance. Let's move on.
because we have important news to share with you. And for this, I would like to invite to come up to the stage to Mrs. Mireya Cañellas, head of the Sustainability Promotion Unit and member of the selection board for the 2023 uh, Circular Economy Hotspot. And also I would say a big applause to Mireya because she is the leader, leading manager of this Circular Economy uh, Hotspot. And, and, and so just welcome her with a big applause, uh, Mireya. Although I don't agree with Susana because we are a big and really motivated team. Uh, I appreciate the applause and I share with all my colleagues. Most of, uh, some of them are still here. Some of them are, are at home resting, having a rest. Anyway, uh, I'm here to, as, a, as a representative of the jury and this is a very important moment. So I would like to say that since 2016, when the first circular hotspot um, uh, took place in the Netherlands, circular economy hotspot uh, events has happened annually in Europe. These events showcase the organizing countries' circular activities and share their best business practices, policies, and approach. They have been successful in stimulating businesses to adopt circular principles and have inspired circular economy actions in new countries. They have created nothing less than a circular legacy. This week, the members of the selection board, consisting of several circular economy hotspot event organizers, come together to decide on the location of the circular economy hotspot in 2023. The selection board consisted of Holland Circular Hotspot, the government of Luxembourg, Zero West Scotland, the host from Catalonia, and North Rhine-Westphalia. The selection board was delighted by the interest to organize Cir Circular Economy Hotspot 2023 with four candidates from Europe, four candidates from Africa, and one candidate from Latin, Latin America regions. The quality of the proposal was exceptionally high and the passion of the presenters was noticeable. There is a global momentum for circular economy as a solution to stimulate our economy, work on the Agenda 2030 and the Climate Goals. The selection board noticed that there is a specific and rather unique momentum for circular economy in every continent and decided to take a revolutionary decision. In 2023, the Circular Economy Hotspot event will not be held in a single country and continent, but will take place in three continents at the same time. The events will be aligned and spread out during the year to generate increased impact. For the first time ever, there will be an event in Latin America, in Africa, and in Europe. Each wine fine-tuned to suit its own dynamics. After 2023, each continent will continue the transition, the tradition, sorry, and host a yearly hotspot event in their own continent. In making this decision, the selection board recognizes that in a world slowly recovering from the COVID, there is increased awareness in the circular economy as a means to take action, especially among the younger generations. A circular world is the only way, is the only way forward. Now, with recovery funds and increased climate action, there is also a unique opportunity to embed circularity within every activity and action in every part of the globe. This groundbreaking decision to host a hotspot in three continents in 2023 supports the global goal to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And now the three winners. <laughs> Chile will be the first country to host the Latin American circular economy hotspot. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> we have a huge delegation of Chile here, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, in Europe, the 23, uh, um, the 2023 Circular Economy Hotspot event will be held in Dublin. <laughs> I don't know if Sarah is still here, but congratulations. And as for Africa, Lagos, Nigeria will have the honor to organize the Circular Economy Hotspot event. Uh, I'm sure they are looking to us virtually. <laughs> We had a really, a really uh, impressive team defending uh, her proposal. So we congratulate the winners. They have the huge but rewarding responsibility to carry forward the circular movement to their region. Thank you to all. Thank you, Mireya, and great news indeed. Uh, congratulations to Dublin, Lagos, and Santiago de Chile. We're very excited to learn that the circular economy community is growing. So it's now time to invite Mr. Reinhold Branker from the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Norra and Westphalia to present the 2020 Circular Economy Hotspot that will take place in Bottrop next September. Please, Mr. Branker. <laughs> so always there might be any problem. You have PowerPoint? Mm, no. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The PowerPoint should be presented on uh, on itself. I hope so. So, it's running. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear activists at the Circular Hotspot here in Barcelona, I'm very happy to invite you in the name of the government of North Westphalia and the city of Bottrop to the next Circular Hotspot taking place from the 12th to the 14th of September next year. In a way, Northern Westphalia is a hotspot of circular economy. We have been the industrial heart of Germany for decades, and we have been well known for steel and coal. We are well known for hardworking people too. We are still strong in mechanical engineering, chemical industry, metal production, and many other branches of production, consumption, and public infrastructure. Northern Westphalia is facing a great change during the last 40 years. Now we are on the bridge from our fossil past to a sustainable and circular future. Change is our DNA, but our DNA did not change completely. We are nearly 18 million people hot to change and develop our country to a better, sustainable, and above all, circular society. We light up the night even if we are changing our energy system from fossil to renewable sources. We are the leader of traffic jam, but we finally bring together all partners for success. We have the most dense research network in Europe. And we are very happy as a government of this country to fund Prosper Collect, our center for circular economy in Bottrop, who will be the host together with the city of Bottrop. We are experienced workers and we are used to organize. 
we are of course proud of our results. Just a minute. <laughs> I try to have a quick look at the slides. <laughs> so we are proud to see Opel Kadett. Maybe somebody remembers this car <laughs> produced in Bochum. <laughs> so we are proud, especially in football, naming Borussia Dortmund, you might know from the Champions League. Or my favorite private club, Schalke 04, also falling down to the second league this summer. We attract investors. And we are hoping to attract you, all of you, joining our Circle of Festival in Bottrop next year. Together, we can and we will prosper by designing circular business models, by designing and developing circular products in the industrial market. We will grow our market in B2B and B2C by circular thinking. We will show you our activities our experiences. We will learn from each other and we will celebrate a circular festival in Bottrop. See you in Bottrop next year from September the 12th to the 14th. Glück auf. Wow, thank you, Mr. Runker. We very much look forward to the 2022 Circular Economy Hotspot in Bob Trop. And we're heading to the closing of the Circular Economy Hotspot 2020, uh, Catalonia 2021. And we want to share with you what has been these three intensive days. Please, video in. This, this images captures the spirit of the hotspot. I, th I hope you can gather these images until next circular economy hotspot in Batrop. And now we shall come to the closing of the circular economy hotspot Catalonia 2021. As a saying goes, to everything beginning, to every beginning, sorry, there is an ending. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mrs. Ana Bernada, Secretary of Climate Action, for the closing remarks. Please, Secretary. Well, I made my little speech in Catalan because it's our language and we are very proud of it. Benvolguts, colegues, amics, senyores i senyors. Ha estat un autèntic plaer i honor per Catalunya hostatjar el Circular Economy Hotspot en aquesta cinquena edició. Espero que hagueu pogut gaudir, tant a nivell professional com a personal. I desitjo que demà pugueu aprofitar igualment la vostra estada aquí amb la participació de la Smart City World Congress. I en el site Events organitzats establint noves col·laboracions i intercanvis que portin valor afegit que segur que heu 
tancat en el mar del hotspot. Certament, els darrers dies han estat molt intensos. 29 itineraris guiats, 90 empreses i organitzacions visitades, més de 200 projectes presentats i 20 ponents de primer nivell. Espero que hagin servit perquè us emporteu bons records i molts aprenentatges sobre experiències d'èxit i iniciatives tractores en economia circular, tant a Catalunya, tant a nivell tecnològic com financer, o de models de negoci innovadors. Nosaltres ens hem sentit molt honorats d'haver aconseguit arribar a les 555 persones inscrites de 25 països diferents. En aquest sentit, espero que la vostra visita al Hotspot ens permeti establir noves connexions, noves col·laboracions de les que emergeixin nous Green Swans, en paraules de John Elkington, que accelerin transformacions sistèmiques en tots els territoris. Com veieu, Catalunya té un ferm compromís a favor de l'economia circular, regenerativa, integradora i neutra en emissions. I hem aconseguit que aquesta sigui una de les àrees estratègiques de la nostra economia i una clau per la nostra competitivitat i innovació. Per tant, vull agrair molt profundament a totes les entitats, empreses i persones que han col·laborat en l'organització d'aquest esdeveniment que sense el seu esforç, sense els seus coneixements i implicació no hauria estat possible. I desitjo que aquest treball conjunt contribueixi per cohesionar una estratègica única de país entre administracions, empreses i conjunt d'actors implicats. Així mateix, aprofito per desitjar molta sort als propers organitzadors del Hotspot Norrin Westfalia, i us animem a mantenir encesa la flama d'aquesta iniciativa dels hotspots perquè estem convençuts que és un motor de col·laboració i de transformació d'ample abast. Compteu amb nosaltres per qualsevol suport que us puguem facilitar. Finalment, vull felicitar molt efusivament a Dublín, a Irlanda, a Lagos, a Nigèria i Santiago de Xile, guanyadors de la candidatura per l'organització del Hotspot 2023. Realment aquest any ha estat un any on la disputa ha estat molt renyida i ens ho deia la Mireia en la seva intervenció entre nou candidats d'alt nivell i ens complau molt saber que la comunitat circular creix. Tot plegat és un indicador més de la transformació cap a una economia, tal com deien, regenerativa, circular i neutra en emissions, que és un camí que hem de fer entre tots i que cada dia es demostra més que és l'únic camí possible. I per això vull acabar agraint molt sincerament a tots vosaltres la vostra participació i agraïm molt sincerament a tot l'equip de la nostra secretaria, a l'Agència de Residus, a l'ACA, també a tota la Conselleria d'Empresa, perquè aquí al darrere d'uns dies intensos hi ha la feina de moltíssima gent molt compromesa i, per tant, el meu agraïment per tots vosaltres. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your active participation in the Circular Economy Hotspot Catalonia 2021 and I hope you will enjoy the program as much we have prepared it. Have a safe trip back to home and see you next year in Botswana. Thank you so much. <laughs>